So, um, yeah, without further ado, next up we have Katie Kohler. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Hope you can hear me. Yeah, is that right? Good. Um, I'm Katie Kohler, and I'm from Child Bereavement UK, which is a charity based near Wickham in Buckinghamshire. Um, and I am, as you see from the, oh, you don't see from the slide because I haven't put it on. There, as you see from the slide, um, I'm assistant deputy director or assistant director. Deputy sounds like, you know, deputy door to me, since I feel I should take a gun out or something. Anyway, I'm assistant director of bereavement services and education for Child Bereavement UK. And I've been with them now for about seven years. Um, but in a prior existence, I was a jobbing clinical psychologist working in a tier two stroke tier three child and adolescent health psychology service. So, so that's, I, I was working there for years, um, far too many years. You can probably tell how many years actually by the fact that I now have my glasses perched on the end of my nose and I can look down at my notes and then I can look up at you. So that tells you roughly how many years I've been, um, was in the NHS for. Um, and my post there was sort of half generic referrals and the other half um, was I was psychology lead for the child development team. Um, so that's where my interest in children with special um, needs or additional needs came from, and in particular children on the autism spectrum. So you might find that there's a few slides snuck in about children with, with additional needs. Um, just to say thank you very much to Elora, who's who sadly had to leave us now, um, for setting the bar so high that I feel like I'm kind of clinging on there with my fingertips. Um, but it's really nice that the association um, thought to have um, a whole day put aside to look at the needs of children who are facing bereavement or who have been bereaved. Um, and really, it's, it's fairly simple. I think most children um, are supported by having informed and sensitive adults around them um, who are aware of their needs. So it's not that this is absolute rocket science and that I'm going to be imparting something hugely different. Um, just really to, to try and enable us to empower the adults around children um, to provide a supportive environment. Um, because bereavement after all is a normal process. It's the one thing that we know is going to happen when we are born. One thing that is sure sadly for all of us. Um, so it's not a pathological um, state, um, but it can cause problems if it's not well handled and well managed for those that are, are left. Um, so today, um, the association asked me to talk a little bit about Child Bereavement UK and what we do, because are, are any of you familiar with Child Bereavement UK? Some nods, luckily some shakes in there too, with some no's, because then I'll be able to talk um, about that. Um, later on today, uh, I believe that there'll be somebody from Cruise and that there will be somebody from Winston's Wish. Um, so this is just about the first bit is just about child bereavement uk and what we do there are a lot of there are a lot of other organizations out there as well is what i think you're meant to say um on the radio if you're plugging something so it's not that i'm plugging this is just to let you know about what we what we do and we do work very closely with um other organizations um we're really closely with winston's wish in london at the moment um for the grenfell tower disaster so who are we so for those of you who haven't heard about us, um, we support families and educate professionals when um, a baby or a child of any age dies or is dying um, or when a child is facing bereavement. So we do both sides of it. So we support parents um, who are losing or have lost a child. We do direct services at a number of locations whilst across the country, whilst we're based in High Wycombe or near High Wycombe, and that's where we first started out. Um, I started there about seven years ago and there were 24 of us. There are now over 100 and we are based across the country, not everywhere. Um, we've got places in London, Cumbria, um, various other places, Milton Keynes, Scotland. Um, but we are able to direct people, families to, by the use of a, a database that we, we have to other services near them. We. In terms of the direct support, um, we always say we're not offering treatment, we're not offering therapy. Again, we emphasize it's not pathological. 
um, but we do offer bereavement support to children and families. And whether we try to be as flexible, we're, we're in a very lucky position being a charity um, that we can be flexible um, and adapt ourselves around what families need. So we do try to bespoke whatever um, support we're providing um, to fit with what the family wants. And whether that's individual one-to-one -one support for a child or for parents, or whether it's couples, or whether it's a whole family, or whether it's groups. We do a number of groups for parents <coughs> whose children or babies have died, but also a number of groups for children. Um, and for young children, those are structured activity groups where they come with their carers. Um, and for our young people, we offer something quite interesting for our young people. We offer something called YPAG, which stands for Young Persons Advisory Group. And that was because we had a lot of young people who actually, they were fine, thanks very much. I'm all right. Yeah, my mum died, so I'm okay. I don't need anything. I don't need support. And I don't need support from a middle-aged old woman, that's for sure. Um, okay, well, let's think, you know, what, what might be support, supporting for you here? Um, well, I'd like to speak to people my age, actually. I'm quite happy to support other, other young people. Actually, yeah, I've got quite a lot I could say to other young people. Um, I'd like to meet other young people. So um, we set up a group of other young people, um, and it was very much not a support group. They didn't want to sit around and say, my name is Andrew, this is what happened to me. But they wanted to provide support for other young people. So they're all there now, all busy supporting each other. And they came up with the name Young Persons Advisory Group because they advise us. And they've done a number of resources for us. They are hugely important to us, actually, as an organisation now, our young people. Um, some of them have come on to be ambassadors for us. Um, but if you look at our website, there's a number of films that they have made, what teachers need to know, what health professionals need to know. And they're quite hard hitting, so prepare yourself when you watch them. Um, to have the, the sorts of things that you say be slated um, by, by the young people. Um, we also do consultancy and supervision and training, obviously, days like this, but we do bespoke training. So if anyone wants to um, have, a, have a look, I've, I've brought a few leaflets for anyone who wants them to know what services we have across the country, um, just um, have a look. Um, this is our helpline or our support and information line. Um, that's open nine to five, Monday to Fridays. And that is for families, but just as much it's there for you as professionals. Roughly 50% of our calls come in from professionals. And that might be because you're seeing a family and you're thinking, oh God, what was that resource somebody mentioned? Or what was that book? I'll just, I can't remember what it was. You can phone up and, and ask our helpline staff who are um, specifically trained um, to answer, answer calls, and a lot of them have got a background in counselling of one sort or another. Um, and there's no question that is too difficult. They've had families phone up where it'll be perhaps a, a mum who'll say, I've just heard that my husband's died and the kids are coming home in half an hour, what am I going to say? Um, so quite sort of cutting edge things, as well as, you know, professionals saying, I work in a school and, and one of the teachers has just been given a term of diagnosis. How do we tell 150 kids. Um, so as professionals do feel that you can use that as much as, as families do. I mentioned our website there. There's loads of stuff that you can print off. There's no point you reinventing the wheel and rewriting stuff that's already out there. There's a number of information sheets you can just download um, for yourselves or for families. There's a number of resources and books. There's a lot of good books by Winston's Wish have done, and I'm pleased to see Susie's brought some along for you to ha have a look at. Um, some really useful information out there. Um, the other thing is this searchable database, the database I spoke about. So if we, if we get calls from people in Yorkshire or somewhere we haven't got um, an office, we can direct you to local supports for that person. Um, so do have a, have a look um, at our database. It's quite simple to use. Um, you just have to type in a keyword and you can find local organisations that might be able to help. Um, the young person section is the one where you'll find all the films that the young people have made. Um, and just, just to say, actually, when you see them, you'll, you'll, you might think, God, these seem a bit slick. You know, I wonder how much Child Brief UK edited them and got the kids to say the things they wanted them to say. I promise you, promise you, we didn't. It's all their own work. And they said what they wanted to say. And sometimes they say things we didn't really want them to say. Um, and sometimes they use language like when my mum passed on 
and that isn't something that we would always say but you know so you can see that it, it is all their own their own work so i guess why do we need to think about bereavement because it's fairly rare right well actually it's not really um and of course um it does depend on how you define it um as the um elora said earlier one in 29 school children um have been bereaved of a parent or a sibling and then if we include bereaved by other people that takes it up to about three so that's three out of 30 roughly so 10 percent um but it depends on how the statistics are calculated and there are no national statistics believe it or not for the number of children bereaved of a parent um, or bereaved of, of anybody um, the government do give you statistics on um, how many children have divorced parents but not of how many um, have been bereaved of a parent um, and I think that last one there that really surprised me that 92 percent of children and young people um, will have experienced a significant bereavement by the time they reach 16. That seems incredibly high. And the interesting thing about that study was actually they asked the young people. Instead of asking the adults around them, has your child been bereaved of somebody significant? They asked the young people. And I think particularly in teenage years, um, if it's a peer that dies, the way that that peer is likely to have died when we first um, causes of, of, of death in that kind of age group, road traffic accidents and suicide, those are quite traumatic ways. They're liable to have a huge impact, even if the young person didn't know that person that well. So they can feel as if they have been bereaved because something significant has happened. But perhaps those are the ones that get missed because the adults around them are not seeing them as bereaved young people and are liable to say things like, well, they never really knew Johnny. He was in a parallel class. How, you know, you didn't really know him, but actually it has quite a fundamental impact, you know, especially in that, um, that age group where they're beginning to think about the meaning of life and all those big questions. Um, so I suppose that is an argument. Um, it does happen. Um, a lot of children are affected by it. But, you know, it's normal part of life, isn't it? Isn't it normal? Shouldn't we expect children to sort of get on with it? Well, the research shows us that whilst it's no, by no means inevitable that a young person or child is going to experience a significant difficulty following bereavement, and in fact, most children adjust well over time and don't need um, specific focused um, interventions, they are at an increased risk of a number of different problems. Um, and there's a lot of evidence out there, a study by Lee showed that parents, uh, those bereaved of a parent, were 50% more likely to die before they reached middle age, which seems incredible. Um, and also another study showing that 13% of bereaved children had somatic symptoms in the clinical range following a bereavement. So that's just on their physical health. There's also evidence that it affects them cognitively um, in terms of their achievement. Um, by the age of 16, being bereaved of a parent, again, is associated, particularly amongst women, women of failing to gain any qualifications. And there's also a lot of evidence for difficulties in concentration and attention immediately following a bereavement for, for children and young people. And in terms of behavioral responses, um, a study by Wilcox showed there was an increased risk of hospitalization for drug or for alcohol use and increased risk of smoking, so increased risky behaviours. And there is a huge literature on emotional responses, as you might um, expect, um, that children who have been bereaved are significantly more likely to have a psychiatric disorder or psychological problems. But of course, that doesn't um, help you when you have got an individual child in front of you. That's giving you rough statistics about expectation that you might have of how a child might respond. But of course, how any individual responds is going to be incredibly individual. Um, and as that slide says, I think there's as many different ways to respond to, to loss and grief as there are children in the world. Um, and so there's no one right way. And again, as Laura said earlier, and I'll probably be saying that quite a lot through this talk, as Laura said, because there's a lot of points um, to kind of pick up on that, that she introduced. There isn't one right way. There's no particular rights and wrong ways of, of doing grief. 
each child is individual and will find their own way through it. Um, but having said that, there are some several factors that commonly impact on the way that a child is going to deal with a serious illness and, and a death. And sometimes thinking about, how, about these different factors um, might inform us when we're trying to support that child in front of us. I don't know why it comes up with two and then one and then another one. I haven't quite, haven't quite worked out the technology of that. But if we think about the factors, and I'm just going to kind of take these um, briefly in turn. If we think about the relationship that the child had with the person who died, um, that's, that may seem obvious if it's a main caretaker. Um, and particularly with children with special needs, if we think about who provides that main care for children with additional needs, um, there might be a, a, a raft of people involved. So it might, we, might, we need to be thinking here not just about death of a parent or a sibling or a family member, it might be the OT, the physio, the speech and language therapist. Um, so a lot of other people who will have had quite close caring relationships with a child. Um, the circumstance of the illness or the death um, Again, we might have in our minds about, you know, what, what's worst as if there's a kind of hierarchy, you know, well, it's worst if it's a sudden death and the child's not prepared for it, um, or it's worse if a child has to see their parent go through an illness and gradually become um, a different person and, and separate from the child over a, peri a prolonged period of time. But I remember th this was sort of put to me really clearly by... Um, a group of mums that we um, worked with whose children had died and there were two mums discussing in the coffee break and one said to the other I don't know how that was for you that must have been ghastly your little boy went out of the house in the morning and he just never came back the child who sadly was involved in a road traffic accident and the the other mums whose child had died in a hospice very planned um, after a prolonged period um, and the other mum said, um, said to her, well, I can't imagine how it was for you seeing your child dying before you. I can't think of anything worse. And each kind of thought that, that they were lucky comparatively to the, to the other. So there isn't a hierarchy. We can't say one is worse than another. It depends so much on all the individual circumstances. Um, but I, I would say to that that if the death has been traumatic or a child has been involved in it in some way, for example, like a, a road traffic um, accident, um, and they've witnessed that, you can have the trauma, which is adding another layer onto to the bereavement. So there's other things to think about too. And obviously in high profile cases, perhaps when it's been a murder or whether it's been something that's been reported on TV, some military deaths, um, then there's again another whole raft of factors to, to think about that will impact on how a child is going to, to respond. And of course, the thing about the media is that it's always there and you never know when it's going to come up. And of course, I had families that are sitting down several years later, it may be after something, and then there's a reminder on the TV, it comes up on the news in relation to something else that's happened. And suddenly that family's fa their faces are again are all over the media. Um, so it's just another thing to, to kind of think about. Um, a third area um, we need to consider is obviously individual differences. The child, you know, is it a child whose glass is half full or half empty? Um, their personality, their previous experiences of illness and death, um, and the way a child acts and communicates and their role within the family, all those family dynamics are going to impact on, on their response. And of course, cultural and, and faith considerations too. And when I think about culture, I think of it in a more widely than just perhaps religious culture or <laughs> ethnicity. It's about the family culture. You know, how does this family do it? How do they talk about death? Is it something that, that's talked about? So those are all things that, um, and if we were to just consider those, and not the support environment. Those are things actually we can't change. Those are things we have no control about. Um, so that's kind of bad news for us as, as um, those in the support industry, if you like, because we can't change it. So the good news is that there is some evidence and a lot of evidence out there of the crucial importance of the support environment. So that's great because that means we can actually make a difference. Um, and so the amount of support, who is there for the child? What support does this family have? 
Um, what are the secondary losses that have occurred because of this death? It might be that a family have had to move house. Um, it might be that they're hugely financially impacted um, by the death. So there may be lots of other things that are impacting as well as the emotional impact of the death of this, this person. And of course, children take their cue from their parents. They mirror often how the parents are responding. So when we're supporting children, we need there's a lot of evidence out there to show that the more supported that parents are, then the better the outcome for children in the long run. So we need to make sure we consider the parents. And of course, in families, I always say families are in the protection racket because parents are busy protecting their children, but children are just as much busy protecting their parents. And so they pick up very quickly not to um, upset mum or dad. Um, or their brothers or sisters, perhaps by mentioning the person who's died. And so a lot of their questions will go unanswered because they won't feel that they um, can ask them. So if we want to just think about, um, I'm just going to take one of those aspects, seeing as um, I'm meant to be talking about children's understanding of death, and I've managed to vary from that remit quite a lot so far. So one of the, the crucial things for children is what do they understand in terms of their, their concept of, of death? What do they understand? Well, luckily Richard Lansdowne did a lot of studies way back in, in the 80s, um, looking at the development of children's concept of death um, and looked at the universality, the permanence and the irreversibility, the kind of key um, aspects of it. So we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in, for different ages. Um, it's not, in fact, till fairly recently, actually, that people sort of thought of, that it was important to consider the responses of children under the age of six months, because after all, what concept can they have of death at that age? Well, obviously, they're not going to, but long before they're able to talk, babies are obviously going to respond to um, upset and changes in their environment. Um, that are brought about by the disappearance of a main carer. So it seems fairly obvious that if it's a, a main carer that has died, there's going to be a response. Um, but also, if that main carer is bereaved, they're going to change, the, the emotional environment is going to be significantly altered. Um, and that is going to influence a child. So it may be that, um, it may be, say that mum has been um, bereaved of her uncle to whom she was very close. Now, in terms of the child's relationship, perhaps the child never even met that person, but it's going to have a significant impact on mum, so that maybe when mum changes the baby, she no longer blows raspberries on his tummy, no longer sings when she's feeding the baby. So the, the whole environment for that child has changed. And if we think about the sorts of things that very well-meaning relatives and neighbours do when there's been a bereavement in a family, is they'll say, oh, I can take the baby because that's something I can do. I can take the baby because I can feed it and I can change it and I can meet its basic needs. But actually what that baby needs really is as much consistency and familiarity as possible. So actually um, having the same person do that caring um, and for that person who's doing the caring to be as supported as possible is going to be what, what might ideally help help that child. Thinking about um, age six to six months to, to two years, um, uh, this is when babies develop object permanence and begin to be aware that things exist even if they can't see them. So from around eight months, a baby who's been previously very happy to be passed to everybody in the family and all the neighbours down the road as well, um, can will begin to be upset when um, there's an absence of somebody and they're then looked after by a stranger. Um, and that's because they now have the cognitive capacity to keep a mental image of the person who's missing um, in their heads and therefore they can miss them. So um, and what we see a lot actually in this kind of age group um, is searching behaviour where a child continues to search for the person who's absent, even if they've been told um, a number of times. I remember a little boy of 18 months whose daddy had died and his routine in the afternoon was to, um, his mum had quite a strict routine of having tea and then had a TV program and then would have bath and just be between TV and bath um, was dad's coming home time and the routine was that the little boy would have his tea, have, 
um, watch the TV, and then we'd go to the window to wait for Daddy, and then Daddy, Daddy would come home and do bath. And Mum had you tried to, to explain as much as you can to an 18-month-old that Daddy wasn't coming back. And his, his language at this stage was he could stick two words together. So he was saying he could say daddy gone. He could actually say daddy dead. Um, but even though he could say that, he still returned to the window every day and went, daddy, where daddy, where daddy? And this was hugely distressing for mum, um, <laughs> but it was something he needed to do. And he was still searching in that expectation that when you search for something, it, it comes back. Um, and that's something that we can we see very often, but of course it's very distressing for for adults to to witness. So age two to five, beginning to develop a, an identity of their own and, and more independence, um, and toddlers might show quite a basic understanding of death when they see a dead insect or dead bird or something. And I don't know if my children were particularly psychopathic at a young age, but they were very keen on dead things. And they used to like to poke a worm that wasn't moving to see if it would make it move. Um, but they don't understand, so they, they might have a basic kind of understanding. And in fact, Lansdowne showed that children of this age can distinguish between dead animals and alive animals in just pictures. And they can sort them into different, different piles, dead ones and alive ones, just from a photograph but they fail to understand the full consequences of it. And children can have a number of kind of concerns. So their, their understanding of death is kind of incomplete. And they may ask questions about, well, I know granny's dead and I know she's not moving, but what's she going to eat when she's in the coffin? So they need those sorts of things explained about the body not working anymore. So they have some basic understanding, but lack the kind of sophistication to know that it's universal, that it's permanent, um, and irreversible. And of course, at this kind of age, they're very concrete thinkers. Um, so the sort of language that we use is hugely important. Uh, um, Elora spoke about not saying somebody's gone to sleep. And of course we do see, I'm sure, you, and as, as you said, you were frightened to go to sleep. We see that so frequently and nobody's put it together that they've actually used the word somebody's gone to sleep and then worried, worried as to why the, the child's frightened about going to sleep. But also the other language we use, we know, and this is not to um, say people's religious beliefs must be respected, um, but I think sometimes we need to add information to that. So if a child's told um, that granny's gone to heaven, um, you know, how is heaven different from Tesco's? Hopefully, hopefully it is a bit different from Tesco's. You usually come back from Tesco's. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of a child trying to understand what heaven is, if it's a place, and so children will often say, well, I want to go there too. And sometimes adults can get quite hung up on children saying, I want to go, I want to die, I want to go to heaven, I want to be there as well. When what they're really saying is um, they just want to be with that person. And the, we had a child who um, mum had explained about, um, about um, their grandmother dying. And the child seemed to be quite accepting, <coughs> hadn't had any outbursts of emotions. And it wasn't until a year later when they went on their first flight to Spain, the child suddenly became incredibly upset, in inconsolable on the flight. They couldn't work out what was going on. And actually, when they spoke to the child, what it was, he said, well, I understand why I couldn't actually see granny, but why is there no one else there on those clouds? Because he'd been told that she'd gone up to the sky. And so he was expecting to look out of the aeroplane and see lots and lots of people. So we do need to be very, very careful um, and remember children's literality in, in terms of their understanding of what's going on. So a child of this age is liable to feel sad and disappointed when their expectations that a person's going to come back don't actually happen. Um, and as we all know, anyone who's had experience with a child of this age, the number of questions they ask. Um, and those are things that actually are not hard for the child, they're hard for the adults around because they're asking very practical what, where, how kind of questions. And they might seemingly have a very sort of morbid interest in the kind of mechanics of illness and death and dying. Um, and I worked with one little boy who actually was on the autism spectrum um, and he had lots of questions about how granddad had died. And mum was great and had told him, you know, that he was going to be cremated. And what does cremated mean? Well, cremated means he's going to, his body's going to be burnt. Okay, his body's going to be burnt. Well, how hot does it get? 
mum didn't know the answer to that so she said well we'll find out I'm not quite sure how hot it, it gets in the crematorium but I'll find out and then the next question was does that mean that grandpa's face melted first and of course that conjured up an awful image for for mum and she didn't want to have those images so she really then started to struggle when he asked lots of questions um, and he had little understanding of the impact now he perhaps had less understanding than your average child might have picked up more quickly that uh, the impact the questions were having on mum and learned not to say them but that's just as bad because children need to ask these questions and we need to find a way that they feel that they're legitimate questions that um, should be answered um, and of course separation anxiety is one of the most common things that we see um, in this age um, and there couldn't be extreme distress at the, uh, when the child's lost sight of, of their main care following a bereavement. Um, but a, a, and another um, important thing, I guess, about language, um, that sometimes children will use the correct language, but actually their understanding of what that means is something very different. And I think we can easily be fooled. And this was brought home to me really clearly by a little boy who um, had done really well following following the death of a, of a grandparent um, several weeks later said to mum and her mum had explained exactly what happened and the child had attended the funeral and they'd been there when the coffin had gone into the ground and she'd used all the right language and the little boy said well I understand now where granny's body is but where's her head and of course I hadn't thought until that point that actually we have two meanings for the word body. I, if somebody had asked me how many meanings are for the word body, I'd have said one or maybe body of water or something like that. But I would never have thought about it because we use it automatically without thinking that actually if it's an alive person and you're talking about their body, they're generally talking about their torso. And if it's dead, that we're referring to the whole lot of it. Um, so I think that was just a, a kind of real reminder for me to, to, to always check out what children's understanding is and not make assumptions. Um, five to eight years, age of magical thinking, where children believe they can influence events just by thinking about things. Um, so it might be that they, you know, they were a bit naughty or they um, pinched their brother um, and, and then the next day their brother dies or they were rude to mum. And the next day, mum dies. Um, they can feel as if they, it's because of their behaviour or something that they've just thought. Maybe they just thought, um, felt angry towards a brother or sister, um, felt jealous and, ha and, and can therefore think that they have caused um, that person to die. And I guess if, <coughs> excuse me, if you think you really have caused somebody else to die, are you going to be that vociferous about it? Are you going to tell people around you, oh, by the way, it's my fault that so-and-so died? So children often um, won't say, won't mention that. So the sorts of things we see at this, this age, beginning to have more of an understanding um, of what death means. And, and Lansdowne showed that actually by about eight, age of eight years, most children, about 80 to 90% of children, will have a pretty full adult understanding of the implications of death in terms of its irreversibility. Um, but their fears at this sort of age are more around the illness and, and death of others. And it's not till they get to around somewhere between eight and 12, they begin to have a, a more mature understanding um, and finally realizing its finality, its permanence um, and its universality. And therefore that it's applicable to them themselves as well. So you're more likely at this age to get um, worries about their own um, mortality, particularly if it's a brother or sister or somebody their age that, that's died and anxieties about their own health. And they're also beginning to understand those full implications um, for their future and how this death might impact on them, not just now, but in the future. You know, is mum going to be there? Um, when I walk down the aisle? Is she going to be there when I get my first job? Is dad going to be there to, to teach me to drive? Um, excuse the stereotypes there, actually, I just realised, yeah, I should, uh, is mum going to be there to teach me to drive? Is dad going to be there to show me how to load the dishwasher? Um, and so you may get many of the kind of adult um, symptoms of grief displayed, but just expressed in, in more childish ways. And 
in the time of adolescence. Um, adolescence is, is a tricky time. There's lots of physical, social, emotional trait changes going on. They're tra trying out different identities, those big questions, who are you in the universe? Um, and so they can struggle to, to find support. And often we find, um, as I said earlier, that children of this age will find support from their peers rather than from, from adults. And there's a quote about teenagers that I like from Jessamine West, who says, at 14, you don't need sickness or death for tragedy. <laughs> Life is already tragic. And it's tragic because your ponytail's not quite right that morning, or it's not quite right because you've got the rubbish trainers and everyone else has got different, the better ones. Um, and I, I don't say that glibly because I think those things are really important to teenagers who are trying to work out who they are. Um, so life is already a struggle. Um, and then you add to that the burden of a, of a terminal illness or a bereavement. And children of this age you know, have their own beliefs very strongly held, and those may be discrepant with the family. And so then you're dealing um, with, with a much more complicated situation. Um, but of course, children can only cope with what they know, as Wolf Sell said. Um, and children tell us time and time again at Child Bereavement UK that not only do they know that something's going on, they also realise that they're being left out of discussions. It's a kind of conspiracy of silence when somebody's died. People stop talking when they come in the room. Um, but as, again, as Elora said, you know, we're, we're stupid if, we, if we're, we're fooled by that, really. Um, if I'm on the phone like this and, and, I, and a child comes into the room and I look over, oh, I'll call you later. I haven't actually said anything about what's happened, um, but a child picks up very quickly that there's something I'm saying that is of such importance and perhaps so dreadful that it can't be imparted to the child. So we're deluding ourselves if we think children aren't aware that there's information being kept from them. And we all know that what children don't know, they make up. They're going to fill in the gaps. And often their fantasies are worse than the reality. And it's us as adults that struggle with, with telling them the reality. So the problem isn't so much that they don't have information about what's happened, but more the quality of that information. Um, that's going to be made up of bits and pieces, perhaps that they've overheard or seen or heard from another child. Um, so they may have an idea of, of what's happening, but likely a very inaccurate one. But the literature again here is really clear. Um, Jennifer Holliday studied sibling bereavement and found out that the long-term outcomes for children in terms of adjustment following death were much more related to the communicative environment rather than the death per se. So the communicative environment was what was important rather than all those other factors that we, we talked about. They, they loaded much more on a child's um, long-term outcome than those other factors. And my experience from the number of children that we see is that children are actually much more able to deal with the truth if it is delivered in an honest and sensitive way. And it's much, they are able to deal with that much more easily than half-truths, dishonesty and inaccuracy, however well-intentioned. And I think, um, like I said, families are in the protection racket. And often that is from most well-meaning um, of stances. I uh, worked with one little boy who had been bereaved <coughs> through his father had taken his own life. And he was being brought up by grandma. And grandma told him that his dad had died in an accident. And actually that story survived for two years and was fine until finally, 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 they held the inquest. And of course it was public knowledge. And a child went into the playground and a child said, oh, your dad killed himself. No, he didn't, he died in an accident. And so what was already a difficult situation was made much more difficult. He then was ridiculed by his peers because they all teased him for not knowing because now everyone else knew and he didn't know. He also now no longer trusted his grandma who had always been as honest as she could in other ways. Um, so he'd he felt like he'd had a triple loss. He'd lost his dad, but he'd also lost his friends. And now he felt he'd lost his grandma as someone he could really, he could really trust. For, you know, for all some very admirable reasons um, why we do it. But I think children can be remarkable, remarkably resilient um, if they perceive them to, to be in an open, honest environment where they feel free to ask those questions. But is there any evidence to show that giving children information can foster adjustment? Um, I would say clinically, I've never had a child come in and complain that they have been given too much information. 
Well, I think you can give too much information to children, but more commonly, we hear that children feel they didn't know what was going on. No one has told them. Um, no one has explained things. And yes, there is some evidence out there. Um, a study by Beale looked at um, the implications of providing information to children. So again, the literature kind of confirms our clinical findings that giving information to children, openly discussing these difficult issues has a positive impact um, in many, many different respects. Um, so when we're giving children information, we're not just giving them information, we also reduce their anxieties and their worries. And we open the curtains in some sense to let some kind of light in on giving them a clearer picture of, of just what's happening around them. But why, why is this topic so difficult? Um, as Elora said earlier, we need to kind of put it in some historical context. And that picture shows how much more involved children were. Sadly, death was much more common occurrence. But it also meant that um, Victorian families, there were clear roles and expectations of how to follow, um, uh, of, of what to do following a death. Um, and that included um, involving children in the proceedings. Things have changed a lot now. Um, obviously, our mortality, child mortality rates are, are hugely dropped, which is great. Um, but there are one in three children now living in what we call fractured families. And so the family life has changed significantly. Um, but funnily enough, the Victorians were much more able to talk about death. It became, it was much more part of everyday life, I guess. And I looked up, you know, we, we talked, um, Elora talked about cancer, about the C word, as it used to be called. I always refer to death as the D word. And I looked up to see, I Wikipedia'd to find how many euphemisms we've got for the D word. And we are very adept. We could come up with 92 different ways to avoid saying death, which is huge. I mean, a lot of those are things perhaps might be local areas use, not in general parlance. But it just illustrates that if we can use something else rather than the word dead or dying, then we do. And, and I think we do um, children a great disservice. So just want to actually mention, as, as you might have thought, I'm going to sneak this in somewhere about children with additional needs. Um, and just because I think there's a kind of double taboo here. If we're reluctant in talking about death and dying to your average neurotypical child, we're even more scared about doing it with children with additional needs. Um, and there's a huge lack of research, which is why these are such old um, dates on there. Um, but there is uh, one more recent study, study done in Scotland um, by an organization called PAMIS. Um, and they looked at children and young people with profound and multiple um, learning disabilities and their carers and carers, family and carers, um, and various professionals. And they've put some very useful practical guidance. So if anyone, I can really recommend their pack. It's sort of two DVDs and, and some kind of workbooks, um, which is really helpful. Um, I mean, I think in some respects, we don't need to think separately about it, because if we if we take the kind of developmental um, understanding of death that um, we, we just talked about, you can apply that to any child as long as you're thinking developmentally um, rather than thinking of their chronological age. Um, but there's one exception to that rule, I guess, and that's children um, with um, on the autism spectrum. I do think that if we expect to understand how a child um, on the autism spectrum might be, might be feeling following a death of someone, then we need to have a very clear grasp of how they see the world in the first place. Um, otherwise, it can lead to understanding and, and misinterpretation of, of behaviour. I don't know if any of you have, have experienced this, but Howlin said way back in 97, a person with autism um, substitute person with autism spectrum disorder for that um, may seem apparently unconcerned even by the death of someone close and they might focus on seemingly callous issues such as how much they've been left in the will um, and I think that is something that I used to hear a lot about um, people on the autism spectrum as being selfish um, but I think the behaviors that children with um, ASD display might suggest they're not grieving I would argue that they are, but they're just man it's manifest in a, a different way. Um, there are a couple of books that have been written um, by people 
um, with autism spectrum conditions themselves and reflecting um, on their feelings through grief that are well worth looking at and I can give anyone the references that wants that wants them but there is very 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 little research and not much guidance the national autistic society has got some guidance but it's not very specific and i would argue that the things that we need to be thinking about are those key areas of difficulty for um, children with asd um, rather than seeing as children with asd as being asd autism spectrum disorder sorry for anyone who's not aware of that um, so rather than seeing children with ASD as being defined by their symptoms, I think we need to look at their um, cognitive and processing difficulties that underlie it, um, because that's what kind of leads them to, to view the world slightly differently. So if we think about lack of theory of mind and leading to difficulties understanding other people's thoughts and feelings and, and interpreting their behaviours, um, therefore their own behaviour can, can appear unusual. But when we think about you know, our, our behaviours following a death, um, they're emotional and they're social. Um, the very areas that um, are extremely challenging for somebody with, with ASD, you know, how to behave at a funeral, for example. Um, young children will pick up very quickly those cues without having to have it spelt out to them what they need to do. Child on the autism spectrum will struggle with that, um, of being able to put the information together in the same way. Um, getting the gist, again, we assimilate inf information from our senses to make some kind of coherent whole. Children with ASD might focus on specific aspects, like perhaps the flowers um, on the coffin, or maybe the bells, um, on, as I said earlier, how hot the, the oven was, um, rather than the emotional sense of what's going on. And in terms of language, as I said, important for all children, but even more important um, for children with ASD. Um, if it's a severely autistic child um, who doesn't have any verbal language, um, they may not have the relevant signs and symbols to use. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the Makaton um, signs and, and symbols for death and, and dying, but there's very few of them. And in fact, they overlap with each other. So the, the one for um, buried is the same as funeral. It's the same sign. Um, and so they're limited. So it's in a way, the opposite problem to the rest of us that are dealing with the Wikipedia euphemisms of 92 of them, um, that actually they've got a few ways of communicating about it. Um, and, and again, uh, even a more able child with um, ASD is going to particularly struggle with those 92 euphemisms. Um, sensory uh, sensory um, difficulties, what do we do when somebody's bereaved? We often want to give them a hug, physical contact. Again, something that children with ASD might struggle with. Might struggle with the acoustics, the lighting of being in places like hospitals, hospices, churches. Um, and imagination, obviously none of us really knows what happens, um, but at least we have got an imagination um, or neurotypical people who have got a, an imagination to try and second guess what things might be like, what death might be like, what the afterlife might be like. Um, but children with ASD are going to really struggle with all the use of all those abstract terminology. Just seeing how I'm doing for time. Doing all right for time? Five more minutes, okay, I might have to speak a bit more quickly. Okay, um, in terms of theories of grief, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's, it's stuff that you can have a look at afterwards. Um, but I'm just going to show you two, very briefly, two um, different models of grief um, that we find particularly helpful at Child Bereavement UK. And one is William Warden's um, Tasks of Mourning. Um, and I think we've moved away from that linear idea that you kind of, is a tick box exercise, oh, I've done that bit, I've done the despair and the upset, oh, I've done the anger, oh, I've done the depression, oh, I've got to the end of it, but how come I still feel as bad? And so we very much take the view that actually grief is a lifelong process. It's about adjusting over time and finding different ways of coping throughout life. It's not something that finishes after six months, not something that finishes after a year. And families that have been um, bereaved often say to us that they feel that society expects them to somehow be over it or somehow be better, particularly after the one year anniversary. Um, and I think, I think what we're trying to emphasize these days is more about bringing the person into um, some the um, 
into the child's life um, in the present and in the future, even though they may not be physically there anymore. I don't know if any of you saw, we had a, a TV campaign called One More Minute, which was about what would you say if you had one more minute with the person who's died. And Jason Watkins said something I thought very profound. And he was talking about the language that people use. And he said, please don't anyone say closure. It's always open. And I think that's really true. That actually is always open. It's just that we deal with bereavement in different ways as we, we carry on through life. But this model of wardens talks about tasks. And I like the word tasks because that implies <coughs> that it's effortful. Sorry, but it's effortful. And the idea is that you address these different tasks, um, not in a particular order, but that you can dip in and out of them over time. Another model that we use at, <coughs> excuse me, at Child Bereavement UK is something by Strobe and Schutt called the dual process model. People familiar with this? Is that something that people have come across? Some, yeah, you find it useful? <coughs> Something I use a lot with families, and it suggests that following a bereavement, we need to do two things. We need to be, at some point, we are influenced by loss-oriented stressors, which are the things surrounding the bereavement itself. So that's um, grief, what traditionally we might call grief work. It might be denial or avoidance of, of what the changes that have happened since somebody's died. So that's on one side, and on the other side is more restoration focus. And that is where we're able to think about the things of everyday life that need doing. So if you imagine, say, a child <clears throat> who's bereaved of a parent wakes up in the morning, that awful realization that something awful has happened. And at that moment, they're loss oriented, thinking about maybe it's mum that's died. Um, they're loss oriented at that, at that moment, thinking about um, how sad they are. <coughs> At that point, perhaps dad comes in and says, time for school. Child has to get up, get dressed, get packed lunch and make their way off to school. So in that moment when they're off to school, they're focusing more on things that they need to do the everyday. So at that point, they're restoration focused. Now, the, the idea is that we, during the course of a day, will oscillate between these two states. And children do something we call puddle jumping, which is jump more quickly. So we're probably all experienced in a child who's one minute absolutely distraught about something and then suddenly seems to switch off the faucet, the tap, and say, can I play with my Lego? Can I go outside? Can we have tea now? So children are more able to dip in and out of their grief, whereas perhaps as adults we tend to, to stick in one or the other. Um, and the idea is that we need to do both of those things. I find this very useful to, to use with families so that they can see that actually they're all doing it differently. That sometimes some people may feel that they're more restoration. And if, to use a huge stereotype, although Australian should have given some evidence for this, that men tend to be more restoration focused and women more loss focused. And so it can be useful for family members to realize that actually they're doing things slightly differently. No one's doing it wrong or, or right, but actually they're just doing it in a different way. So what do we commonly see um, following a death um, in, in terms of children's reactions? Um, so I've just listed a few things there that we've, we've kind of covered developmentally. But just to remind you that children will revisit their grief at different developmental stages. So as their understanding changes and they're developing cognitively, so we would always say that grief is really a lifelong period of, of adjustment. Um, <coughs> but death isn't on the curriculum and managing bereaved children isn't in teacher training programs. So when do we need to, to worry? Up here, I've just put a few kind of concerning behaviors. If you see any of these things, these are things that might suggest that actually this child's struggling and needs further support. And whether that further support is from a bereavement organization or whether actually it needs referral to CAMS or whether it needs the input of school counselors or um, whatever might be available. So if in doubt, seek um, advice. Um, and refer on if you need to. Um, 
But one thing that I would say is that schools have a huge role to play. And I don't know if any of you here are from schools, just to stress the importance of the school environment, some really simple things that can be done in school. Um, and remembering that school is a bit of an oasis for some children from the emotional environment at home. Um, schools already provide consistency, provide structure, predictability, and also can provide a listening ear um, for, for children where there's a very high emotional um, environment at home. Here's a few very practical things that you can do in the immediate aftermath of a, of a bereavement. Um, what children need when, when events are abnormal um, is actually more of the normal more of the, the routine and um, consistency to help them feel uh, safe and secure and give life predictability. Um, but of course, to, to maintain those behavioural expectations, whilst flexibility perhaps in when maybe homework needs to be given in, they can be given extensions, but also in terms of what their behaviour is like, that I would argue you actually need to have the normal um, sanctions in place and that you need to have um, normal expectations um, of the child. Um, other short-term things that schools do, you know, give a kind of get out of jail free card that a child can um, just put on their desk to show that they need some time out and have time, a safe place to go. And also to identify a particular person. Now, some children will be fine about going perhaps to a school counsellor, but a lot of other children won't because they don't want to be seen to be going to the school counsellor. They don't want to have to explain to their friends that they're going to a school counsellor. And anyway, the only time they can go to a school counsellor is at 10 o'clock on a Monday. And actually, it's Thursdays that are really difficult because Dad died on a Thursday. And it might be that the person they have the best relationship with is the um, playground supervisor or the caretaker. So there might be somebody to whom actually they've already got a relationship that they've just feel that they feel they can talk to. So it's always advisable to um, have that consultancy, I guess, with the child about what they find. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize all these things weren't on there. Yeah, there we are. Sorry, I've been talking to an empty slide. Anyway, that's just by way of recap. And in terms of longer term support, let's put them all up there. Um, and I think, again, support for school staff, because like I said, um, teacher training doesn't include bereavement. And I think some staff can feel very de-skilled and, and not quite sure what they, they should be doing. But I think there we go. Um, if we can reduce anxiety in the time of high emotion and high stress when somebody dies in the school community, if there's a clear structure to follow, that can make things um, much more um, easy for everybody involved. So if there's a clear policy or framework around bereavement, usually there's, uh, most schools have critical incident plans, um, but don't always have bereavement plans. Um, and the kind of sometimes people will argue, well, every, every situation is different. And that's true. But I think it can take the anxiety out of the situation to have a rough idea as long as it's flexible about who's going to do what um, in a school community you know who's who is it that's going to inform parents who is it that's going to inform the children and how and when and that is just about it for me um, when i was googling how to do a decent powerpoint presentation a little while ago it told me I should have three take home messages because after all, um, any psychologist will tell you, we forget 90% of what we've learned within three days. So I thought I better identify in case, in case you've missed them, the three um, key messages to take home. One is for everybody who has contact with a child um, to have the confidence to jump into that water and address it. It's not some, you don't need some magical recipe for dealing with bereaved children. Um, you need to have some difficult conversations, but you're not going to make things worse by at least addressing it. I think we get very worried as an organisation, as a society, about using that D word because um, we don't want to make it worse. I can remember April. Does anyone remember April Jane Jones, a little girl who was murdered um, in Mid Wales, sadly, several years ago? Uh, I remember her mum saying in her witness statement that friends would literally cross the road rather than talk to her. 
And that was because people were frightened of getting things wrong. They didn't want to say something that would upset her again. But the worst has, has happened. Um, much better for us as mental health professionals to empower the adults surrounding a child to provide the right supportive environment. Of course, individuality, no two children are going to do it exactly the same way. So you can't give a script or a recipe. Um, there's no one size fits all. I don't know about you, but when I go into M&S and I see one size fits all, I think, well, one size fits who? It doesn't fit me. Um, so we just need to keep that in mind. And then lastly, communication, open and honest communication um, is the linchpin really that it all hinges on. Um, as William Shakespeare said, no legacy so rich as honesty. Now, he was a master of a good story, um, but he clearly valued the importance of the truth. So rocket science, it ain't really. Um, and just so that you don't feel on your own with this, if there's any um, more information or resources and stuff, do, don't reinvent the wheel, do see what's out there. Um, do phone us up if you need to, or have a look at the website. And that's all. Thank you for staying awake. <laughs> This is when I find out that actually you were asleep, but just with your, with your eyes open. Uh, this isn't so much a question, it's more, um, I heard um, James Bulger's mother recently on Jeremy Vine, it's worth listening to, quite powerful. And uh, so just wanted to share that really. It was, uh, you know, talking about her guilt and everything and the process, you know, the process she's gone through. So I don't know if you get that on the internet, but it's really quite powerful to listen yeah. to her, yeah, James Bulger's mother. And in so, such in the public eye, something yeah, like that. Does yeah. everyone remember James Paul Justin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she just released a book, and she was that's why she was talking on there. Right. So, um, but yeah, it was very, very powerful. And it's yeah. interesting because you might think any parent would be able to put themselves in mm. in a, in her position of God. That could have happened to me. Mm. You know, ten seconds of letting go of a child's hand. But I remember having a conversation with my uncle, who was well, should never have been there with a child without stra straps on. Should have had straps on, and had no clue of how quickly. It can happen and mm. i think there's that huge judgmental aspect to it when something's mm. in the public eye yeah, yeah. like that yeah, but she, but she was very open about her grief on the on the radio it was very powerful right was that recently yes yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. last friday yeah oh yeah, right so, so still probably getting yeah. on a podcast yeah or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 most of us have a memory of being lost have we yes um, of, of turning around and you can't see where the people you were with have gone mm. and that's sort of a common experience mm. Mm. Very common. I mean, yeah, so I think we're probably all preaching to the converted in here. I think any, anyone here would be able to see how that could happen very quickly. But how she's living with that feeling of guilt. And I, I don't know about you, but <coughs> the families that I've worked with where a child has died, every single parent that I have met has feelings of guilt about something. Um, um, I was talking to mum the other day, his child died of neuroblastoma. And there was, she did absolutely everything in terms of caring for him, um, but she still feels, she said, yes, but I failed because a mother's job is to see their child into adulthood, and I failed. Um, so I think that is a really, really tricky one to get over, that feeling of guilt. much about um, uh, counselling and supporting young children with a, on the ASD spectrum. Did, did in I terms of that? research, in terms of research evidence yeah. out there, there's not much. No. Not much at all. I mean, there is. There are some. There are some books on mm. trying to. You know, there's a lot of stuff on social stories yeah. and things that's kind of come from another literature. Hasn't come from bereavement literature, yeah. so it's been applied. Okay. Um, so there are some some books out there on how to support children through bereavement, but there's about I'd say there's about three. Okay. Um, mm. I haven't mm. brought them with me. I have got a copy of anything that there is on anything to do with okay. ASD and bereavement, yeah. and it's very very little. Yeah, because we're in I'm in a position with a student at the moment. Um, she lost her father back in October, and um, she's ASD. Um, and we've yet to get her out of the car in the car park, um, very often not dressed, covered in a blanket. And 
nowhere else to go now because I know we've got different issues to address and I feel probably the first one we need to address is grief and which is leading I think to depression yeah. and not wanting to engage with anybody at all okay. so I think I feel like we're losing her rather yeah. than engaging with her yeah and it can be very difficult to know what's due to what mm. really perhaps discuss it with you at lunch that if, would that's be lovely. A, if that's okay yes, thank yeah. you um, I just remember one uh, young man that we worked with whose mum had lunch um, and this went on for a couple of weeks and it wasn't until um, a teaching assistant came back in after the two weeks to said, well, no wonder he's not eating his lunch. She's put, he's put his crisps in with sandwiches. Now, dad knew that he only ate Marmite sandwiches, only ate cheese and onion crisps, but what he didn't know is not to put the bag of crisps in with the same box that sandwich was so actually it wasn't no response it was just more to do with how things were done and liking as with any child what's due to what thank you i've got a couple of really quick questions from the live stream um firstly could you send me the references um again um for how to support um children with asd so i can send them to everyone via email yes that'd be wonderful thank you that's easy <laughs> um and the second question is how do you deal with um and kind of remain sensitive to cultural and ethnic beliefs and belief systems when talking about bereavement Okay, I think that's really, really important. And I think we can sometimes fall foul of it because we may have worked with, I don't know, a number of Jewish families say, so we think we then know how Jewish families do it. Or we have worked with Muslim families, so we know how Muslim families do it. Um, but it's the same as anything, that actually you've got to take the wider culture in. And there's, I always think of culture as like the worst Venn diagram that there ever was because there's so many overlapping circles um, to, to think about. There's the context in which the person's living, there's the community, there's the nationality, there's the religious aspects, but there's the family culture as well. So I would always be asking the family. And so I'd be asking them for what language they use and trying to reflect that. So much as I would want to be using the words dead and died, I am sensitive to whether if a family are saying passed away um, I might at some point have a conversation about that um, about what they, they think their children understand by that term but I wouldn't be imposing my values um, on the family's values so it's about it's about giving people choices um, and informed choices I guess thank you 